I'm Samantha Miller, and I'm joined by my colleague, Martin Smith, who is an architect at NCARB and the Assistant Vice President of NCARB's Experience and Education team. During today's webinar, we'll be covering the basics of how to become a licensed architect. So that includes starting an NCARB record, the requirements for experience, education, and the examination, plus how you can expand your career path with the NCARB certificate. So we'll have about a 25 minute presentation and we'll have plenty of time for question and answer at the end. So if you have any, you can submit them through Zoom using the Q&A tool on your screen at any point. So before starting uh, today's presentation, Martin, if you could tell us a bit about your role at NCARB and what you do. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. It's a pleasure. I've been with NCARB for about 11 years. Um, prior to that, I did work in architecture firms in the New York City area. Uh, doing a little bit of everything. Uh, I am licensed in the state of New York. Um, and since joining NCARB, I sort of helped expand our outreach to universities and AIA components. Um, and now I'm a little bit more focused on program development, working with our volunteers. We have um, hundreds of architects who serve on our committees to develop all of our programs, whether it's AXP, exam, um, as well as the uh, certification requirements. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Martin. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A tool on your screen. With that, Martin, I'll turn things over to you and I will see the rest of our attendees later on. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to give a little brief overview of the licensure process. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about AXP as well as the certifications alternatives um, and paths to gaining licenses across this country. So, um, and I'll be talking about all of our programs in brief. So to get started, let's talk about uh, licensing is a career move. Um, it is what give, opens up your opportunities to get what you want out of your career. Um, whether that's just A, getting the title architect, because you can't um, have that title architect until you get a license to practice architecture in that state or jurisdiction. Um, there is, the ability to gain more um, access to value as in money, uh, because once you have that license, you can take on more responsibility in the office. If you take on more responsibility, they should pay you by increasing your salary. And if that doesn't happen, then a perfect time to find other work. And sometimes that's the best way to increase your value. So, um, or start your own firm because you, because you can't practice architecture or be an architect without having that license to practice architecture. Now, I represent the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. Um, we are made up at the 55 jurisdictions. That's um, the 50 states, District of Columbia, US Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Northern Marianas Islands. They're our members. We work with them, they work with us. Um, we're here to help facilitate that licensure to uh, help create standards across this country. So if you meet the requirements for one state or jurisdiction, you will hopefully be able to meet the requirements for other states and jurisdictions. And we do that through our programs, through our education standard, through our AXP, the Architectural Experience Program, and the Architect Registration Examination, ARE. Um, all of these will lead your path to be getting a license, to get a license in each of our jurisdictions. Um, that being said, states still are the ones who set the requirements to practice as well as what other requirements to become licensed as an architect. So it is always important to go to your state to validate that information. One good thing is NCARB does a lot of great resources to help you navigate these. And one way to do that is with our licensing requirements tool, which if you go to our website, you can click on explore licensing requirements tools right here. And what we do is we ask a lot of our states and jurisdictions some basic questions about initial registration. And based upon how they respond, it populates this map. So for instance, if you're someone who does not have a degree from an app program, you're trying to figure out what states do I have options for, click here. All the ones in blue require that you have a degree from an app program for initial registration. The ones in gray have additional opportunities and paths for you. So use this tool to navigate the different requirements for initial registration, or once you are licensed, well, what do I need to do for reciprocal registration and requirements to get licenses in other states? For instance, which states allow me to get a reciprocal registration through one of the education alternatives for certification? All the states in blue potentially have a path for you to get a license if you do that alternative path to certification. But one thing that's always important 
is that oh, once you pick a state that you're looking getting your first license, is go to the, the page on our website under the detailed section and review each of the details because that way you're making sure you're getting all that information. And then finally, make sure you go to the state's page because if you wanna be an architect, you need to meet your state's requirements to ultimately practice architecture. And they're gonna have all the details um, on, their, on their page and something's not clear, give them a call. They're there to help you navigate this process to ultimately be an architect. Some other great resources out there are our architect licensing advisor community. Uh, if you go to ncarb.org slash findmyadvisor, you can find advisors for your state, your local area. If you're in a school, who is the advisor at my school? These are people who volunteer their time to help you navigate all these requirements as well as can give you some good career advice because they act as mentors as well. To be able to start any of these things, whether it's gaining experience or taking your exams, you do have to have your NCARB record established. It is $100 for the initial application fee. Uh, and then $85 a year to keep it active. You will want to keep your record active because that gets you access um, to be able to fulfill your requirements to ultimately become licensed. Um, if you go to our NCARB site, click on login, go to establish record, and then follow the prompts. It's pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to go into each of the components. Um, education is pretty straightforward for me because I'll say, go get your degree from a NAB accredited program. It does make your life easier and expedites your process to licensure. Um, and no matter what, any type of ar architectural education you have, whether it's an undergrad, a non-accredited program, or an accredited program, make sure your school sends your transcripts to NCARB directly. Um, we do have our form 122 on our website, which walks you through that process. Um, they can send it to it digitally is what is preferred. The digital is the way that we prefer things to be sent to us, but they do have to come directly from the institution. Um, if you do have a degree that is not in English, they do need to be translated into English. So make sure they go from the institution to the translator and the translator to us and never walk into your hand because that just minimizes any potential issues. And even though NCARB does require transcripts, it's good to have them on our file because when we send your record to the state, they will look at all of your history. Um, some states may require that you send transcripts to them as well. So just be aware of that when you're going through the process. For the architectural experience program, um, there are some basic things I want you to be aware of. Is first of all, this is your tool to develop the competency to practice architecture. Um, your, it identifies the 96 tasks that you need to competently perform at the point of licensure. Um, so use this as your tool, use it as your conversation base with your supervisor, with your boss, with your firm, with your mentor, um, but become familiar with this document, with this program. And one way is to the AXP guidelines, make sure you download the most current version, become familiar with where information is at, and I'll walk you through some of the basic details for you to be aware of. The most important section are our experience areas. Each of the areas have a little description of what that area is about, as well as the tasks that you should be competently performing at the completion of AXP. So the way you think of these tasks is you look at the area that they're in, and that is how you should be performing that task. Because some tasks are a little bit more general, but they're ultimately associated to that area in the description above. So, and if you're not certain about a certain task, talk to your supervisor, talk to the architect you work with, ask them about it, say, hey, I don't feel too confident in this. I have no clue what this task is. That is important for you to empower yourself to get the experience that you need to ultimately practice architecture. And the more that that firm helps you become a more well-rounded person, the more value you bring to that firm as well. And you may find what you enjoy in the architecture profession and you might be surprised. There might be some areas that you had no clue or no interest in until you started performing them. Now there are six areas. Each area is a different aspect of architecture. Each of them have a certain number of tasks and then a certain number of hours to complete that area. Once you hit the minimum in each of the areas and get the 3740, you're done AXP. But don't stop submitting just at that point. Submit all experience that you've gained up until the point of licensure because it's better to have 8,000 hours in AXP than not enough at point of licensure. Because some states do have additional experience requirements that that additional reporting will help you ultimately meet those requirements in most cases. Now, the ways you gain experience, there are many. 
But the most common way is working for an architect or architecture firm that is lawfully practicing architecture. Um, this is what we call experience setting A. You are required to do at least half of your experience this way, but you can gain all of your experience in this opportunity. And this is the way that most people go through the AXP. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that is like, let's say you came to work for me and I had an architecture firm in the state of New York. Because I'm an architect, I'm licensed in the state of New York, working for me would be considered experience setting A. Um, or if you're working for an organization, make sure that organization is meeting whatever the requirements are in that state or location to be able to offer architectural services. And your supervisor has a US or Canadian license to practice architecture. That is the basic for experience setting A. Now, there are other ways to gain experience. This is what we call experience setting O. And for this, I like to bring up the AXP guidelines because it's really good to get familiar how to go through this document. And with regards to experience setting O, if you go to page 16, we have this great little chart that sort of walks you through each of the opportunities that you can gain experience if you're not currently working for an architect or architecture firm. Now do keep in mind, each of these opportunities have a limit to the amount of hours you can gain towards AXP. And the most important part is make sure you go to the additional information to understand what ultimately qualifies under this opportunity and who approves it, what types of experience, because some of them have more detail. That walks you through the requirements to ultimately be able to count that experience that you're gaining towards AXP. Not all of these require that you are working for an architect. Um, you can be working for an engineer, landscape architect, architect in another country. All of these would ultimately qualify, but do keep in mind you're limited to how much qualifies and in some cases where those experiences will go into AXP. Another reason why I say it's good to report all experience up to the point that you're licensed is there is a reporting requirement. You are required to submit any experience that you want to count towards AXP within eight months of gaining that experience to count it as 100% towards AXP. Anything older than eight months, you can still submit as long as it's gained within five years, but 50% will be deducted from that report. Um, but please do not wait eight months to submit experience. Find out a time frame that is shorter. Have that conversation with your supervisor. Say, hey, how often would you feel comfortable with me submitting experience to you? We recommend once a month, once every two months at most. And if your supervisor is fine, maybe once every two weeks or once every few weeks, um, have that conversation with them. Shorter time frames are always better because A, you're closer to when you gain the experience and B, um, you are being more aware and your supervisor can look at it and get the information a lot faster. Um, also, if you're starting to run into issues, it's better to find out earlier than waiting for a longer time frame. We do try to make things as smooth and easy as possible for you to be able to submit experience to your supervisor. So we do have the app, as well as you can do it through your NCARB record by going to the experience tab and clicking on create new experience report. Um, also, when you're creating those reports, there are multiple ways to create those reports. There are weekly reporting, what we like to call timesheet reporting, where you can put experience in every day, just like you're doing your um, timesheets for work. Or you can do bulk reporting where you pick a start date, end date, and submit all the experience between those two dates all at once to your supervisor. And then there's duration only report where you're just basically putting the start date and the end date and no hours into the system. That's just for meeting some additional requirements that some states may have. Now, let's say you're someone who has a bunch of experience older than five years and aren't currently working for an architect or aren't able to finish AXP with the experience you've gained in the last five years but you have enough experience older than five years, you're like, hey, if I was able to submit all that stuff, I should have been able to finish AXP over five years ago. Then you may be a perfect candidate for AXP portfolio. Um, if you meet the requirements for eligibility, which I would recommend going to the AXP guidelines and reading the past last few pages, which go into depth about eligibility and the process for AXP portfolio. If you meet those requirements or feel like you might, feel free to just apply. Apply and then we will walk you through the next steps and what you need to do to either finish AXP the standard way or finish AXP through the portfolio process. Um, so that is a great program available for those who have a lot of experience older than five years outside of the reporting requirement. Now, as I mentioned, I, I had a lot of things in brief. Um, we'll definitely get into some Q&A at the end, but all of this information is in the guidelines. Please become familiar with the document. Even though you may just work for an architect and, and most likely will gain all of your experience that way, 
Um, do be aware there are other ways to gain experience, especially if you're working for a firm that doesn't a firm that doesn't do everything in architecture. And you might be limited with certain areas or have troubles getting out on the job site for whatever that case may be. There are other ways to gain experience. And that's where you take advantage of those other opportunities that are available to you. Now for exam, I'm gonna speak very briefly to exam. My goal here is to give you a little bit of strategies and how to start thinking about pursuing this path because I know a lot of people are testing and sometimes the biggest struggle is trying to figure out how to get started how to navigate it, and how to ultimately get those successes. Um, so this is just another aspect to um, your licensure process. And every state is going to require that you complete the ARE. One nice thing is we did align AXP and ARE and that the divisions of the ARE are equivalent to the, um, um, the areas of AXP. Um, but do keep in mind, there are different ways of getting at that information where in AXP, you're sort of developing that competency to perform those tasks, where you're learning how to work with contractors, work with clients, put together a construction set of drawings. Um, the test is assessing your knowledge to perform those tasks. So this is one thing to keep in mind. Um, and each of the divisions have a certain number of items, which, we, which are questions, um, and a certain amount of time to complete it in. Um, and even though you uh, might want to uh, finish that area of AXP prior to taking that division of the exam. It's not a requirement. Um, in most states, you can start testing once you complete their education requirement, which is once you graduate, graduated with that degree from a NAP program. Um, but again, the most important part for you is to create a strategy. Look at these six areas, figure out, well, how am I gonna navigate through this test? And, um, and make sure you study. And where do you start? Well, you start with our resources. We have a lot of great things to set your foundation to your studying habits. Um, start with our video prep series. There are a bunch of introductory videos that help you walk you through each of the divisions as well as a test as a whole. So if you go to our ARE preparing for the ARE section of our website, go click on video prep series, it'll list all the videos that you can watch to get yourself familiar with the test and what to expect. Then the next place to go would be the exam handbook, because a handbook will sh show you what is covered on the test. It'll include content areas, all the things that you are being test on, tested on. And when you're trying to figure out, well, what division do I start with? Well, look at the content covered under each division and then see, do you feel confident with the content covered? If you go, yes, then great. Probably with just a little bit of studying, you'll be able to succeed at that division. If you're looking at all the content and what you're being assessed on and you go, whoa, I don't know half of this stuff, then you either need a little bit more experience or you need to do a lot of study to ultimately overcome um, some of those things that you are missing in your knowledge at that moment. The next thing to look at is before you start scheduling and figuring out how to start taking those tests is read the guidelines. Those are the logistics to taking the test. This covers what to expect in the testing center, um, timeframes, as well as the fees and um, rescheduling process and the testing accommodations. So if you're eligible for accommodations, you wanna make sure you get all that stuff set up before you schedule anything. So again, just like the HP guidelines, skim through it, become familiar with the document so that if there's something in there that pertains to you, you are aware of it before you run into the situation or issues later on. And then once you're getting ready to start testing or getting ready to go into that test center, Go to the ARA 5.0 community, post your questions, any concerns you're having or feel things you're not certain about, and the community is there to help. And that is a bunch of other people are testing or people who recently completed their tests, as well as NCARB staff. We're there to help you get accurate information and make sure you are able to ultimately get what you need to achieve your goal of success at the exam. And then no matter what, before you schedule your first test, and before you start sitting down to take that division in the test center or at home, do the demonstration exam. Become familiar with all the tools. Use the whiteboard, use the highlight, strike through, take a break, play with everything so that once you're in the test center, you're not trying to figure something out at the last minute and waste time just trying to figure out how to do something. Also, if you do study sessions or study uh, tests or practice quest tests that are outside of the demonstration exam, use the tools in the demonstration exam because that is what you're gonna have in the test center. Um, this helps you become comfortable with the tools that you have available to you because that is all you're gonna have. And as long as you know how to use them and navigate them, then you will have less issues in the test. 
testing situation. And then if you are planning on taking an online proctored version, which right now you can either go to a Prometric Center to take a test or go through their online proctored version through ProProctor. We recommend before you even schedule the online proctored version, do a test run. Um, these are, um, there's no cost to you as a candidate to uh, do a test run. It's a great way to run through the process to make sure all the systems work on your computer, that you have everything set up in the space properly. And this way, you're not losing that money because if you get to the testing day and there's something you can't change or something not working, um, you're, you're going to have some issues and you may not be able to test at that moment. So it's better to know in advance. Is your internet working well enough? Is it strong enough? Is, are all the things working to the sufficient level to be able to take a test on the testing day? So highly recommend this. Um, if you go into your NCARB record and go to the exam tab, go to schedule test run, that is the way that you can test out the online proctored environment. Please make sure your space is set up based upon the video on our website and the information in the guidelines before you even do a test run. So that way you're trying to emulate what it's gonna be like on testing day. Another thing to be aware of um, is that we have an update to a testing vendor. We currently been with Prometric for many years, but um, coming early 2022, we are going to be uh, migrating over to PSI from Prometric to PSI, um, we will be giving you at least three months notice with regards to when that date will happen to give you plenty of time to prepare for that, whether you want to continue at PS, uh, with Prometric or if you want to um, wait till PSI becomes available. And then second of all, if you ever schedule a testing time with Prometric, you will be testing under Prometric. Um, you will not have to worry about, well, what if I schedule Prometric? Will I ultimately get scheduled for the same time at PSI? If you're able to test with Prometric and schedule a date with Prometric, you will be testing with Prometric. Our goal is to try to alleviate as, as, as little, to make sure there's not any confusion with regards to that process. Um, and yes, PSI will be offering um, online proctoring as well as in-person um, testing opportunities, just like Prometric in that way, but it will be a slightly different system and we'll be giving you more information um, at the end of the, by the end of the year with regards to this process and any updates as we have them. Now, the most important thing for you all is to get used to the guidelines and the handbook and go through those resources and know where information is at so you can ultimately achieve your goal of having success at the exam. So this brings me into the final thing. So you just finished your exams, finished AXP, have a degree from an app program you're going, great, I just got licensed in, let's say in my case, in the state of New York. What happens if all of a sudden my company goes, I want you to be the architect for a project we're doing in Connecticut? Well, I will not be able to get a license in Connecticut. I will not be able to practice or be an architect for a project in Connecticut until I get my license there. This is the whole point that NCARB exists. We're here to help facilitate that licensure for you to be able to practice where you want to practice, when you want to practice, and, and ex expedite it in a way that ultimately uh, allows you to meet your business requirements. This is where this is why NCARP certification was required uh, was was uh, invented or created. There we go, created. And to become NCARP certified, the most standard way that people do it is get that degree from an app program, finish AXP, finish the exam, have at least one active license to practice architecture in U.S. And then, bam, you're NCARP certified. Just give us a call. Sometimes there's some paperwork that needs to happen. Sometimes there's fees at the state side. But once we have all the documents. Within about 30 business days, we um, will typically process you, and then you become NCARB certified. Um, this will allow you to add some letters to your name, NCARB. That is the first time that you can have NCARB on your name is if you are an active NCARB certificate holder. Um, so keep that in mind with regards to that credential. Now, let's say you didn't have that degree from an app program, and you're going, well, I have a foreign, I have a degree outside of US or Canada. And you're like going, how can I meet these requirements for certification or licensure in the US? Well, we do have the Education Evaluation Services for Architects, ESA, um, where when you go through that process, you send your transcripts and information about your coursework to NAB, the National Architectural Accrediting Board. They review that information and compare it to the NCARB education standard. They will let you know if you have to do any additional coursework or tests to ultimately overcome anything that you're missing in your education outside of US and Canada. And then once you have completed the ESA process, 
then you've sort of met the NCARB education requirement. And once you get licensed in a state and have AXP and the exam done, then you can become NCARB certified. This is also a great way to get a license because many states do accept ESA in, to replace the uh, NAB accredited um, program requirement. But let's say you're someone who does not have that degree from a NAB accredited program and have some type of architecture education in the US or something even less than an architecture educa education, but you currently have a license in the US. And you're like going, how do I get my NCARB certificate? Well, if you have a bachelor's degree that has a significant amount of architecture coursework and have been licensed for three, at least three years, then you can complete two times the AXP requirement and that will lead you to NCARB certification. Um, but do keep in mind, you need to get that license first. And usually in most states, they have a little bit of longer time frame. You have to gain more experience to ultimately get licensed. And then once you're licensed, you need to be licensed at least three years before you're eligible for this program. But what's nice is you can be documenting. They're getting back to if you document all experience up to the point of licensure, you will most likely meet that two times AXP requirement. But do keep in mind, you need to meet two AXP, two times each of the requirements in AXP. Um, which is two times the hours in each of the areas. But let's say you have something less than that four-year degree in a, in a, in a, with a significant amount of architecture coursework. There is a path to certification for you as well. Um, this is where you, A, get a license in one of our 55 jurisdictions, become licensed for at least three years. You can do an ESA on any education that you have if you have a certain number of credit hours at least. Then, you do a certificate portfolio. You don't have to do an ESA. Um, you can just do the whole portfolio. That's completely acceptable. And if you do have a, a bachelor's degree of something, you can uh, avoid doing the gen ed aspects. Um, however, this is where you will take your work as an architect to demonstrate your, um, your um, uh, gaining the necessary uh, uh, knowledge that you would have gained if you had an education. Um, so that's what you're basically doing in that process is using architecture work to overcome the, what you're missing in the education. Um, so, and it, that is something where you submit it and we have architects, volunteer architects who review that and give you feedback. And as long as you follow what they're asking for, you can ultimately succeed and become, and become the NCARB certified. And that will open up more jurisdictions for you to become licensed in. So if we have some foreign architects um, on this uh, webinar um, and you're trying to figure out, well, okay, I got a license outside of US and Canada and some of the states and some of the countries we have jurors, um, MRAs with, how do I get a license in the US? Well, if you are licensed in a state that has a disciplinary board and has a regulatory authority over the practice of architecture and has the ability to issue a license to practice whatever that means in your country, um, you will have that country send us, a, I mean, fill out a document that we call the credential verification form. They submit that to us in English. If they don't do it in English, have them send it to a translator, translator to us, as well as you need to get transcripts to us. Whatever transcripts, whatever education you use to ultimately get that license in that form in that country outside of the US and Canada. Um, once we have both of those documents and they meet the requirements for the foreign architect path to certification. Then you'll do AXP, finish the exam, and then you'll become NCARB certified. Once you're NCARB certified, that is where you will actually use that to get a license in one of the states or jurisdictions that accept this path. Um, do keep in mind, while you're waiting for those forms to come in, you can still submit experience for AXP um, at any point. Uh, it's great to do that. Submit all experience that counts towards AXP. But once you are flipped over to the certification path under Foreign Architect, um, all past experience qualifies at 100% credit once you've been made eligible for the Foreign Architect path. But it's good to have stuff in there while you're going through the process. So let's say you're gaining, you are licensed in one of the countries. Like, what other reciprocity do you have? You've heard me talking about ways to become certified, or what are ways to get licenses outside of US? Well, we do have a mutual recognition arrangement agreement with with Canada, where if you're licensed in one of our signatory states um, to this agreement, then that will allow you to get reciprocity between US and Canada into the provinces. Um, then we have an MRA uh, with um, uh, through the tri-national um, agreement between Canada and Mexico. This is a way that once you've practiced for 10 years, you have the ability to submit a, a dossier of your experience 
and then have an interview. And that will allow you to get a license into Canada or Mexico or into the US if you're licensed in one of those other countries. For the MRA with regards to Australia and New Zealand, very similar. Um, once you are licensed in one of these three countries and have 6,000 hours of post licensure experience, that will allow you to become, uh, get reciprocity between the jurisdictions, between the countries or localities, depending upon where that may be. Now, the most important thing to understand about NCARP certification before I sort of close out my little session here is that it means you meet the national standard to licensure. It does not mean you have a national license. It does not mean you can immediately get a license in all 55 jurisdictions. What it does is it says you meet the standard. And then when we submit the stuff to that state, that state will review it and say, hey, great. You have all the information we need, but here's some additional documents that we may need to ultimately get licensed. The nice part in some states, it may happen as quickly as a few days, or it might take longer depending upon if there's additional documentation. And in some jurisdictions, they may have an interview. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. It does not mean that you avoid requirements, but it does ultimately help you expedite that process to becoming licensed outside of your initial place of licensure. Now we're here to help. NCARB is always here to help. Always contact us. You can engage with us through Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, go on to the Area 5.0 community. If you're struggling with a test, post about it on there. Other people will give advice or ways that they overcame that um, barrier that they had to ultimately achieve a success. And the more you converse and the more you talk, the more you might find something that will ultimately help you achieve your goal of licensure. Also, if you're the person that everyone is asking about exam, talk, asking about AXP, then maybe you should join our architect licensing advisor community if you're not already one. Email us at advisors at ncarb.org. We'll walk you through the process and gets you access to a lot more information and resources that can help you help others achieve their goal of licensure and the practice of architecture. And with that, we would come to the end of the presentation portion. And we will, uh, um, after the session, if you have any additional questions, give our customer service a call. This is their number. You'll also find it in your NCARB record in the My NCARB dashboard, um, or just contact us through the Contact Us page. But if you're looking for immediate responses or immediate answers, give us a call. They're always there to help. And typically the wait times are under five minutes, so you should not be waiting that long. And with that, let's go to some Q&A and I'll stop sharing. All right, thanks, Martin. That was very insightful. So as Martin mentioned, we are switching gears to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So if you have any and you haven't already submitted them, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button that you can click on and type in your question. So first question, if I work at a non-AE architecture engineering firm and max out on the number of hours I can earn in setting O, how can I still gain all the required experience hours? Good question. So I'll go, this is a very common thing that happens for people that are sometimes in the other opportunities. And if you haven't already gained that experience setting A opportunity, which does happen sometimes, um, there are several things you can do. You can A, talk to your firm, uh, to the company you're working for and say, hey, is there any way that you can set up an arrangement with an architecture firm that we work with that you might be able to loan me out to work for that architecture firm? That is some ways that people do it. As long as that architecture firm has control and knowledge of the work that you're doing, control over it means they're giving you, giving you red lines and saying, you need to do it this way, you need to do it that way. They're able to give you experience that ultimately can help you complete AXP. And as long as you're paid for that experience that you're gaining, for that work that you're doing, then it meets the requirements of experience at an A. The other opportunity is that um, sometimes it happens is that sometimes you just have to change jobs. That if that company has no way for you to gain experience at an A opportunities, then say, hey, I wanna finish my licensure. I would love to come back to you all, but give me a year to go work for an architecture firm and then I can come back if, if you still want me back which is usually gonna be the case because if you're a valuable employee, they're gonna want you even more once you've achieved your licensure to practice architecture because you're gonna become another asset to their company. Um, so don't be afraid to do those changes, um, but have that conversation with your firm and figure that out. And if you're not comfortable doing that with your company, because obviously you're talking about, hey, I'm thinking of leaving you all, talk to a mentor first, talk to another architect, talk to an engineer or someone else that you know that is not connected to your company, that you can get some honest feedback and advice on how to navigate that type of situation. Because at some point, 
you will need to get at least 1,860 hours of experience setting A working for an architect or architecture firm lawfully practicing architecture. Thanks, Martin. So we have a question about the education requirements. What are my options to get licensed if I did not earn a degree from a NAB accredited program? So this is where you go back to that licensure requirements tool that I showed in the beginning. Um, if you do not have that degree from a NAB program, click that question under initial registration. It'll identify the 17 jurisdictions that may have a path for you, depending upon what type of education you have. Um, so once you look at those jurisdictions, see if it's a state that you're located or someone that's nearby or a state that your company does work in, and then look into, and then look into their additional requirements. What will you need to do in lieu of that education from an accredited program? and contact the state, ask them, is there anything I need to be aware of? They will let you know, they will give you the paperwork, the items, and then pursue that requirement. And in most cases, um, you will need to do some additional experience before you're eligible to start testing. And some states, they may not have any additional requirements and you could start testing now while you're going through whatever that experience or education requirement is of that state. But that's where you start once you get your license, you can come back to NCARP certification and then see what states accept that education alternative, and that will allow you to get reciprocity. Thanks, Martin. We have a question about collaborating with your AXP supervisor. So my previous boss has not approved my experience reports because they don't know how to do it. What can I do to help them? So this is something I'll, I'll start by saying, uh, for anyone who's just starting off with AXP, uh, have a conversation with your supervisor first. First go, hey, are you the person I'm gonna be submitting my experience to? And then if they say yes, then what is the email you want me to use? Because you're gonna populate your report with all that information. Once that's all done and you click submit, that supervisor should get an automatic email that gives them the next steps to ultimately approve that experience report. And if they don't get that email, ask them to check their spam, junk folders, that's the other way. Um, and then if they still can't find it, if you use the email that's connected to their NCARB record or their My NCARB account, they'll, they will be able to just log into it and find all that information under their supervisor or mentor section. Um, in some cases, see if you can set up a meeting with them, spend a half an hour, ask them to log in to their My NCARB account with you there if they're comfortable with that. If they're still not comfortable with that, have them contact NCARB customer service. They can walk them through the steps on how to get access and approve your experience report. Um, the most important thing is have that conversation with them, follow up with them. Just don't rely on systems or emails as a way to do that. And if you're still running into an issue, it sounds like the supervisor is interested in working with you on figuring it out. So sit down and walk them through because some supervisors are not familiar with this process and it's just making them aware and, and helping them walk them through the process. Um, if you end up with a supervisor that is very like not wanting to help, not wanting to do it, and hopefully that is not a case that any of you are in, um, that's where mentors become very helpful. Talk to another architect that you're friends with or familiar with or another architect in the office. Say, hey, I've been doing all these submissions. I've talked to them multiple times in person in a meeting, and they're still not reporting or approving reports. Have the other architects help you out in navigating that um, situation. Thanks, Martin. We also have several short videos on our YouTube channel. There's a playlist just for AXP supervisors. So you can also send them a link to those videos. We have uh, recorded step-by-step -step instructions on how to sign up for an NCARB account, which is free for your supervisor, step-by-step -step instructions on how to review and approve experience reports and other help tips. So that's another resource that you can check out. Another experience related question, does work experience expire like exam divisions do with the rolling clock? As long as you've submitted the experience in a timely fashion, obviously the reporting requirement, and it ultimately gets approved by your supervisor, no, that experience will not expire. It'll be there till you complete the program and once you're licensed and into the future, um, that will not expire. The only way that experience ex expires is if you do not submit it in time. So make sure you submit in a timely fashion. Right, and an exam question, how do I start testing? So the way you start testing is, well, first study, use all of our resources, become familiar, 
Um, and then make sure you look into the guidelines. It walks you through the process about how to schedule, how to do things with that. But some basics are, once you're in your NCARB record, go to the exam tab. You are gonna select a jurisdiction to begin testing with. That is gonna be the state that you are interested in getting your first license in. Um, once you pick that state, in some cases, it automatically turns on your ability to start testing. In other cases, some states may take longer. It could be that you might need to fill out some paperwork on the state side. Um, it may be that it takes a longer for that state to review all your information to ultimately open up your eligibilities. Um, if it's been oh, a few days or a week after you requested eligibilities, give customer service a call. They can let you know if there's anything missing, anything you need to do, and help you walk you through the next steps to ultimately achieve that eligibility to start testing. Can you do a mix of AXP portfolio and AXP hours? Um, you can be doing both, but keep in mind, you need to complete the entirety of one of them. So if you completed a couple areas with hours, and then you decide, well, I can't finish AXP through hours, but I'm eligible for portfolio, you can switch over to portfolio, but you will need to complete the full portfolio, demonstrate each of the 96 tasks through exhibits. Um, people ask, well, why is that there? Because why do I have, if I did the hours, then why do I need to demonstrate through exhibits? Because there are two different ways of demonstrating the competent performance of those tasks. And the program was designed through hours, was designed that once you demonstrated um, once you've completed all the hours, you most likely have gained all the competency in each of those 96 tasks. With exhibits, it's requiring you to demonstrate competency or gaining of competency through exhibits. So there are two different ways and the state wants to see that you've completed one of them. I saw a similar question related to the AXP portfolio. If someone is going to do the AXP portfolio or think they might be eligible, should they still record their hourly experiences? Well, I will always go, if you have experience to submit from the last five years that qualifies for AXP, first submit all those five years worth of experience. Because um, first of all, if you apply for a portfolio, we're gonna require that you do that first. <laughs> um, so once you submit the past five years, you may be done AXP. If you're not done AXP, you may be pretty close. You may just decide, well, let me start testing. By the time I'm done testing, I'll be finished AXP. And you didn't have to apply at all. But if you submit all the experience you've gained in the last five years and only have a third of AXP done, you're like going, oh, it's gonna take me another couple of years to finish AXP based upon my current experience, then apply for AXP portfolio and we can walk you through the next steps. If I let my NCARB, lap, if I let my NCARB record lapse, do you need to start over with the experience? Um, no, because as long as you reactivate that record at some point, anything you submitted and ultimately got approved will still exist in your NCARB record. Um, the reason we like you to keep things active is because uh, even without your record being there, there are expenses for us to keep your information secure. And those fees, which we try to keep low for all licensure candidates, um, do help cover all the expenses that you're, um, well, cover a little less than what it costs for us to keep your record secure and safe. If I completed the IDP, which was called the Intern Development Program, but didn't complete the ARE, am I required to complete the AXP? If you, completed, if, if you completed the IDP, that is equivalent to completing AXP, you are done the experience requirement. Just check your NCARB record just to make sure that's accurate, because I know sometimes um, if you did it a while ago, you may have thought you did paperwork, just it's always good to check. What types of employment are considered, quote, design and construction related? The way I like to think of design construction related is it's doing something related to what we do in an architecture office. Um, so obviously it's, uh, it's doing things related to the 96 tasks of AXP. However, you have no architect, no, light, no um, landscape architect, no engineer there to approve your experience. This could be doing something like this a theatrical set design company, a shop drawing company, a lighting layout company. Um, again, if you're performing tasks that are related to AXP and it's related to what we do in the architecture profession, the way you're performing those tasks, then you could count that for AXP. Keep in mind, um, the supervisor does not need to have any type of license. They're just whoever is your boss or whoever has control 
and knowledge over the work that you're gaining. Um, you will be limited to 320 hours, which is approximately six weeks of full-time experience. Thanks, Martin. Can foreign architects who are completing the foreign architect path do the AXP portfolio option? Um, once someone is eligible for foreign architect path or planning to pursue the foreign architect path, you are required to submit all past experience through hourly reporting because um, the uh, the AXP portfolio is only for licensure candidates. And at the point that you are using a foreign architect, you are now designating in our system that you are an architect, not a licensure candidate. So that is why that is different there. What is PSI? What is PSI? It is another testing uh, provider. Um, if you are getting your license in California, PSI is the uh, company that offers the, uh, um, uh, the CSE, the California Supplemental Exam. Um, so it's just like Prometric, it's a place that you go to take a test. They uh, manage um, the, uh, the testing environment. It's the best way that I can say it. So if someone is completing the AXP portfolio options, do they still need to find a licensed architect to sign off on their experience reports? So if you are doing the portfolio option towards uh, AXP, um, you will, if you're currently working for an architect or with an architect, um, you will need to submit your portfolio to that architect. If you're not currently working for an architect or with an architect, um, this is someone who has a license to practice architecture in the US, um, then you can identify a mentor who you've known for at least a year, and that person will serve as your portfolio supervisor. Uh, they are ultimately, they all AXP portfolio supervisors need to go through a training, uh, which we have a little um, AIA continuing ed course um, through our uh, continuum education courses that are free to all um, uh, architects that allow them to learn what their expectations are, what they are doing and what they are um, validating by approving your exhibits. Um, so that is, it. yes, you will need to have an architect because they are basically validating all of your past experience and that you demonstrated competency in the 96 tasks. Martin, you just mentioned our CE program. Do any of our CE courses or the AIA continuing education courses count toward the AXP? Yes, so if you go to that page 16 of the AXP guidelines, there is the AIA continuing ed for HSW, which you can go in, review that section. It talks a little more detail. You do have to have an AIA transcript for those courses to qualify. So give that AIA number to when you go to Lunch and Learns. And as long as they qualify for HSW, you can count it towards AXP up to 20 hours per area. You identify the course connected to the tasks that are in those areas. So if you're not certain about how that course qualifies or what area you should put it in, talk to the architects you work with. Talk to the architects who are your mentor. They can help give you guidance on where best to put that course. Um, with regards to continuum education courses, there is the, profession, um, the professional conduct um, continuum course that is free for you all to take, where if you just take that course, it automatically gets um, uh, dropped into your AXP area. That's an additional to the AI continuum ed for HSW. How do I start the ESA process? Uh, well, I'll go there. I believe um, when you put your foreign education in, there's a way to do that in the NCARB record. If it's not certain, give our customer service a call. They can walk you through the next steps. I would recommend doing that and getting a little bit more feedback and understanding before you pay the fees because there is a cost. I believe it is $2,500 now for the cost of ESA. Go to our website. All the fees are listed um, to make sure you're up to date. I do know those get updated on a regular, a yearly basis. Do I need an NCARB record while I'm in school? Um, it depends. Um, if you are in school and you are doing things, if you are did a summer experience ship or you're uh, doing some things outside of a class, such as the design competition in your free time, and you want to count that experience towards AXP, then yes, you're going to want to have an NCARB record. If you're not doing anything that qualifies for AXP, then no need to have an NCARB record. Um, I would recommend when you get into your final year of school to start thinking about that. And the other thing to keep in mind is when you're interviewing with firms, ask them, will you help cover my NCARB record fees? Will you pay my $100 initial application fee? If they say yes, take that job because they'll pay it for you and you don't have to pay it. 
Um, so take advantage of those opportunities and ask those questions because you'll find out if that firm does value you getting licensed. It's a good tip, Martin. And we know from our data that the majority of record holders start where they're, while they're in college. So it's a great opportunity to ensure that you're earning full credit for any summer internships you have or any opportunities you're earning while in school. When can I start sitting for an exam? So when can I start testing? <laughs> um, so um, that is what we call eligibility. Um, and it is a state who sets that eligibility to test. Um, in most states, it's just having a degree from an app program. Uh, in some states, they may have some experience you need to complete. Um, and in some jurisdictions, they may not even require the degree from an app accredited program. So this is part of your research. If you're trying to figure out what jurisdiction works because you're going, okay, I'm ready to test right now, but where I'm located, they have a requirement that I'm not able to meet at this moment. So where can I go to start testing? And if you start testing for that jurisdiction, great, meet that requirement and you can get your first license there, especially if it's a state that you know you may work in or your um, firm does work in. And if it's not, and it's just a matter of getting started testing, and you're ultimately able to become, become licensed, get your first license where you're located or where you originally want to get licensed, contact NCARB. We can help walk you through and understand how to change mid-process. If you decided for one state and wanted to go to another state, we're here to help you out to understand that. Or say, hey, actually, it makes more sense for you to finish up in that state and then come back through NCARB certification. Or actually, it's not that big of a deal. Um, we'll process this information, we'll get you over, it might be some additional fees on the state side, and we'll, we'll process you and you can get licensed in that state. So that's, so don't, don't get so hung up on where to start testing if you're not certain, because you're going to feel like I'm setting my goals for two years from now, I have no clue where I'm going to be. Don't worry about it too much. This is one thing that's changed very much at NCAR from when I went through the process, is we try to make that area, that way of going through this process a little bit easier and give you more opportunity, but it's still the state who sets your eligibility to be able to start testing. And also it's the state who sets the requirements for you to ultimately get licensed. So keep in mind, you have to meet most both of those at some point along the path. How far back can I count prior work experience toward the AXP? Well, if you're gonna finish AXP through the hourly reporting method, you, have to, you can go up to five years back. Anything older than five years, um, uh, is great experience. However, it does not qualify for AXP. Uh, do keep in mind, if you were right now, got done with this call, this video and go, hey, actually, I, I just realized I've not submitted anything in the past five years. You can submit all the past five years experience if you've been working at the same firm for the same supervisor for the last five years in three experience reports. Do two reports for the last eight months because one report cannot be more than six months. And then you do a third report for everything eight months back from today to five years back. If you're trying to create those reports and you're getting error messages, read them. They tell you where the issue is. If it doesn't comply to the reporting requirement, just fix the dates so you're within those eight months and then eight months to five years back. And if you're still having trouble, call our customer service immediately. They will help you understand what dates you need to put in to ultimately do that properly. All right, we have time for probably one or two more questions before we wrap up. What's the difference between an architecture license and the NCARB certificate? So a license allows you to practice architecture in that state or jurisdiction. It allows you to have the title architect in that state or jurisdiction. Without that license, you cannot call yourself an architect. As you heard me say in the beginning, I'm an architect licensed in the state of New York. I currently reside in the state of Pennsylvania. Here, I'm not an architect. If I had on my business card, Martin Smith architect, I am not meeting the state's requirements. So that's what licensure means. Um, and in some cases, they call it registration. The NCARB certificate means you meet the national standard for licensure. And in most cases, it, you have at least one active license in a 55 jurisdictions. Um, and then it helps you facilitate your licensure into other jurisdictions. Um, it keep in mind is in some states, they may allow you to start going after work in that state with just the NCARB certificate because they know that you can easily get a license in their state. Do not submit proposals, call yourself an architect outside your jurisdiction without contacting that state first because you do not want to get in trouble or have any issues with the state, especially if you are planning to practice 
or get licensed there at some point along the path. That's a good distinction. So the license is issued by the individual jurisdiction. However, the NCARB certificate, as the name implies, is issued by NCARB, and it can help you earn licenses in all 55 jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Last question before wrapping up. Do I have to finish the AXP and earn a degree before I can take the exam? I will go, the big quick answer is no. But it depends upon the jurisdiction, obviously, because some states, actually one state and a couple territories still require that you finish your education, finish your experience, then you can become testing. But those are outliers in this case. So most will allow you to start testing once you completed the education requirements. So again, you can be taking your test while you're doing your experience. Just don't jump, jump into testing until you feel confident and ready to start testing. This is something very important. Um, make sure you use all of our resources, all of our documents, figure out where you're comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, you need to do more studying. If you feel very comfortable, still do some studying and then go take the test. Um, if you do not feel ready, keep preparing. But do keep in mind at some point, you're just gonna have to say, okay, I need to schedule a test. because. I will say for, for myself included, I never felt ready to start testing when I took my first test, um, but I still jumped in and I still got it done and ultimately became licensed. Yes, I've heard a lot of candidates say that just having an appointment on the books can be a great motivator and sometimes you just need to jump in and start your first test. Mm -hmm. So with that, Martin, before we sign off, could you share your top tip for aspiring architects? Well, I will go, the biggest thing to do is first have a plan, have a strategy, have a way to navigate through all these things and advocate for yourself. Um, AXP is a tool to help you gain that experience to ultimately be able to practice architecture. In the exam, even though it's big and, and assesses your knowledge, um, there are a lot of great tools to help lead you towards success. And if you do run into any issues or problems or, or, or get a fail, which is not the end of the world in the, in the, in the exam, Talk about it, communicate that with others. The more you're open and share your struggle, the better chance you have of someone identifying something and giving you advice on how to ultimately overcome that. Um, and who knows where it'll come from? And I would definitely recommend read the stuff of people actually offering advice that supports you to ultimately or doing something that you haven't done. And, and just try to be careful to avoid all the negativity that can sometimes happen when you talk about your struggle, especially in very public forums. But it is one of those things that um, there are a lot of people that have been in a similar situation. And sometimes it's better to hear that, um, how they succeeded um, to ultimately give you that um, boost that you need. But again, start with NCARB stuff. We're all here to help. NCARB is here to help. The state licensing board is there to help. We're not here to keep you from becoming licensed. We're not here to keep you from becoming architects. We want you all to become architects. And as long as you got a plan, got a strategy and you don't stop, and if you run into issues, give us a call, talk to the community and share, and people will be there to help and give you advice that can help you go to that next level. Well, thank you, Martin. And thank you for all of our attendees for joining us. You can catch a recap of this video uh, probably tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And just to keep in mind, um, we are hosting another version of this exact webinar, but in Spanish on April 1st, if you'd like to join us then or know anyone who would. So thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Goodbye.